I guess I get an opportunity to tell you guys about my life. Um, I'm from Greensboro, Alabama, and uh, when I was born, I, I was a premium. So I weigh, I weigh a pound and a half at birth. Uh, I born with a huge growth up under my neck that prevented me from really growing the way I should. So my family and I, we moved to Tuscaloosa, and I had surgery. So I didn't walk until I was three. And by the way, it's 10 of us. So I have five brothers and four sisters. Uh, we live a normal life just like everybody else live. Um, my dad worked at Ziegler's. We had the good life. Uh, when I was five years old, after my mom cooked that good fried chicken, I wanted some more. So I ended up going to the stove and I pulled hot grease all over my face and half of my chest. So I got all the skin burned off my face and half of my chest. Uh, my chest looked like a birthmark right now. My face came back pretty good. Um, but I stayed in the house at least three or four months. It took a while for me to get where I'm going. Um, my, my dad left my mom at an early age. So we lived a life like anybody else lived. It was 10 of us, but my, my dad just up and left 10 kids. So we had to move straight to the projects. So when we moved to the projects, everything changed. Um, my mom basically struggled. My mom never worked a day in her life, but that's the most, that's my hero, my mom. She never told us what we couldn't do, and that's why I'm successful today. But when you move to the projects, the projects is a different world. I know we're in education, people always say things the same, but things are totally different from kids from the projects and regular kids. They get treated differently because I know I got treated differently. People think you can't learn because you're from a certain area or a background. But in the project, I never learned anything other than we had shade tree mechanics, we had drugs, we had everything going on in projects. And I'm from, I'm from the Woodmark area, Crescent East area, so we was locked within. And my mom didn't have a, a vehicle or anything. So we could never leave out of the project. So my whole world was the project. So everything I knew was the project. Everything I seen was the project. So I basically did not know I was poor until I went to Holder Elementary and I got a chance to be with the white kids. And I understand, I was saying like, why they don't have patches and holes in their jeans? Why their mom and dad bringing them to school? Why I gotta ride this just yellow bus? So it took me a while to understand a lot of things. And two, my mom was so poor that people don't understand that I've been raised on food stamps all my life. I've been on welfare all my life. I've been on free and reduce all my life. So people don't understand, they think everybody on food stamps want to be on food stamps, everybody on welfare want to be on welfare. You do not want to be in those conditions. My mom actually had to buy food stamps. My mom got $236 a month to raise 10 kids. Part of that money she got to use to buy the food stamps. How much money you gave, how much food stamps you got. If that food ran out, we just had to do what we had to do. But I did, you go through things, and you understand the way we was raised in my household, that everybody had an understanding that once you get up to a certain age, you got to chip in. Now me in high school, I was an outstanding athlete. I could have ran track, football, I could have did it all. I'm pretty good. But my family come first. So you had to do what you had to do for the family. And by the way, when I was in the ninth grade, I'm riding a bike that I made myself with no brakes. <laughs> and I got hit by a car. And I got hit hard. So I had to have surgery on my right knee. But when you're poor, you can't go to the regular doctors. So I went with that, I went with that injury for about two years. We're going to the emergency room. They just bandaging it up. But when you don't have good health care, that's what you get. So it took us a while. So you have to have an understanding that if I didn't have my older brothers to follow, I followed my older brother. They, they ended up working at Mary Bird Hall at University of Alabama. I followed those guys anywhere. But as I got an age, the manager used to see me there all the time. When I got in 11th grade, he said, you want a job? I said, yes, I want a job. So I started working as a dishwasher in 11th grade. I met these two black individual guys, they ran the cafeteria, Alonzo Rose and Greg Nelson, those are my heroes. I patterned myself after you guys. I, 
I know they, want, they thought about, why is this guy following me all the time, asking me all these questions? I pattern myself, they dress a certain way, I want to dress a certain way. They talk a certain way, I did it all. Within six, within six months, I got moved up to management over 100 and some employees in the 12th grade. And that, I just made it do what it do. And any employees, my employees raised from, ranged from anywhere from 16 year old to 60. And I was in charge with them, I was the night manager. I did that. And then I decided that, hey, I want to get married. So the best thing I'm going to do, I, I went and married my wife on the project. She, she was in Crest Nice. I kept it real. <laughs> so it's nine of them. But since, since, since my, I didn't never had a father, I never knew how to raise kids, it scared me to death. So I said, I'm going to get a job at Still My High School Minute for three months. I ended up doing that for 10 years. I worked two full-time jobs for 10 years to support my family. When I was a dishwasher, I, made, I brought home $478 a month. I made seven or $8,000 a year, and I worked hard. And when I was over there as a dishwasher, I'm gonna be honest with you, people did not call me by my name. People say, that boy, get that boy to do this, that boy to do that, all of that. But once I became manager, then I, I got a name. I, I became Mr. Robertson as management. But I believe that you got to work. You got to work extremely hard. I had the opportunity to quit all the time. I had the opportunity to tell people, my mom on welfare, I cannot achieve. My daddy left me, I cannot achieve. I had all those opportunities. I got hit by a car. I was a premium. I had so many reasons. We need to challenge our kids. When we say kids can't learn, we use that as an excuse. I, I overcame everything to learn everything I can. And I'm constantly overcoming everything. When, when, when the city schools needed a food service director, and, and people were trying to contract us out with $3 million in the hole, everybody gave up on the child nutrition program. Everybody gave up on everything with child nutrition. Now, Dr. Winters, they spotted me, him, her, him and Dr. Crawford. They knew I was managing at Amadani. I was already managing contract services. So they asked me to have the job. And they asked, they said, if you can do the job, if you can turn this program around, you can have it. That's what they told me. But when I got the job, my whole staff at, at, the, at uh, Steel My Heights, they, they didn't support me. They said I wasn't educated enough. I wasn't smart enough. Ms. Ferguson always told me, you can do it. And my biggest hero of all, my mom. I went to my mom, she told me, you can do it. So that's all I needed, because my mom never told me what I couldn't do. In my, in my eye, I can do anything. So when I took the job, everybody around me telling me, you can't do this, you can't do this. I have turned this program around. I have twisted it, and I made one of the best programs in the country now. That's not bad coming from a kid from the projects, that people say, don't know nothing, he can't achieve, he can't do this. So it, every time someone challenges me and tell me I can't do anything, I think about my mom. And my mom, I go back to her and, and think about what I can do. But I'll tell you the amazing thing about my whole story is that my, my family, my kids, I got four kids, two boys, two, girl, two girls. Corey went to A&M. He do the same thing I do with Bama Down Food Service. Natasha went to the University of Alabama in Stillman. She's working with Wells Fargo, doing well. Shakita went to West Alabama. She's an RN, about to make ninety some thousand dollars a year now, traveling nurse. My youngest son, Carlton, he's at UAB. Um, I forgot what it is, but he's doing it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 he, 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 he likes good engineering, that's what he's doing. So he's doing it. And the thing about this, that, that they don't know anything about food samples or welfare. I don't think they said, Daddy, write a check. Write a check. That's what they tell me all the time. And my youngest son, my youngest grandson, Jonathan, is amazing. He's in the first grade, but he's like a little, little 50 year old man. He knows everything. He always asking questions. You know, a story about Jonathan one day, he talks a lot like me. And I'm trying to tell Jonathan, I told Jonathan, Jonathan, can you be quiet, Jonathan? He's a papa, you want me to learn, don't you? 
I can't learn if I can't talk. That, that, that he told me. So that, told, that tell me about him, okay? And the amazing thing about my whole family, I got siblings, all of us in Tuscaloosa, and they re work very hard. All of my siblings are in service jobs, whether they're mechanics or nursing. Uh, uh, they're doing everything, food service. I, my mom taught us to put others first, respect others not to steal, and do the right thing. And, and that's the way she taught us. And if, I, if I can tell you anything that, that I, I think, I, I see a lot of things when I go out to schools. And I see the kids, some kids get treated better than others. Like, I'm gonna use my son for example. My youngest son is so bright, Carlton. He's so smart, I think he can make it without a teacher. You know, somehow a teacher, somehow our kid's gonna make it anyway. But sometimes I think we fail with some of our, our, our kids that are poor because we don't get it the first time. Kids have to have an opportunity to fail and pick themselves back up. You know, you give them an the opportunity, they will make it, but we have to give them that opportunity as educators. We just can't give up on kids. You know, and, and one thing about me growing up, when I grew up, we, I wore everybody clothes. When, you know, all this sagging all the kids doing now, I invented that. I was doing that in the first grade. I was wearing my brother's clothes in the fourth grade. You had to tie knots and everything around to make it happen. But that's what we did. You had to put cardboard in your shoes. We did everything normal. I mean, we went to school, people wrote on your clothes to see if you're gonna wear them the next day. We got home and you strub it out, you wore. We missed we mix weeks and weeks of school sometimes because we didn't have the, two, the necessary materials to start school with. So sometimes we say these parents, are, they not good parents or whatever. Sometimes parents, parents need help. Sometimes kids need help. So we need to identify what's going on with a kid rather than just putting, saying this kid can't learn, this kid can't achieve. If, if, we, if we really think about it, and we're gonna be true educators, we gotta look at the whole picture, the whole body of the child. Okay?